Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank the conference for inviting me. This has been a really fun conference so far. Um, I know the title in the program says Black Hole Formation in Core Collapse Supernovae. I'm going to talk about shock breakout in very low energy supernovae, which fits the bill of exotic transients a little bit better. Uh, in many cases, said very low energy supernovae are accompanied by black hole formation, so we, we are a little bit on theme. All right, so uh, here's a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to go over some theoretical considerations for shock breakout, particularly in the very low energy case. I'm going to talk about several simulations I ran with the Castro radiation hydrodynamic code to model what these transients are going to look like. Uh, since we have plenty of observers here, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about what they're going to look like, and we'll finish off. Okay, so very quickly, we have a reasonably strong case for believing that a large fraction of core collapse supernovae fail. This is a quick summary of some of the constraints we have. Uh, we know that at least 50% of core collapse supernovae do need to go off because otherwise you can't fit the nucleosynthesis correctly. Uh, we have a number of um, theoretical results pointing towards a f uh, possibility of failure, particularly in the mass range 20 to 26 solar masses, but some probability of failure existing at, at all uh, masses. So, so to start off with some definitions, we define a failed core collapse as there's no outgoing explosion produced directly by the collapse of the iron core. And we therefore define a very low energy supernova as some transient produced by a massive evolved star that has a final kinetic energy significantly below 0.6 beta, 10 to the 51 ergs. Uh, generally, most of these are going to be well below three times, uh, three times 10 to the 50 ergs, uh, 0.3 beta. So in, mo in these cases, we have a, a fair number of core collapse failing, but we know that the hydrogen envelope has to get ejected in a lot of these cases. In fact, we were talking about several of these mass loss mechanisms yesterday. Uh, you can, it's very hard to fit this, the stellar mass black hole population statistics unless you have a large fraction of these stars that are collapsing to black holes, shedding their hydrogen envelope at some time in their lives. So there's many possible ways for a massive evolved star to produce a low energy transient. You only need about 10 to the 47 ergs to kick off the hydrogen envelope. So there's a, a range of transients that aren't really big enough to unbind the star, but are big enough to kick off the hydrogen envelope. And this is what we classify as very low energy supernovae. There are several channels towards making them. In fact, we've talked about some of them again here so far. Uh, there's uh, the specific mechanism that I've worked on before is neutrino mediated mass loss during a failed core collapse. You have the proto neutron star forming down in the star. It sheds its binding energy. This results in a rapid drop in apparent mass to the core and this is enough to create an outgoing shock even if the actual core collapse itself has failed. Uh, there are many other channels towards creating these low energy events. I'm not going to go into that. We're going to just specifically say we're studying a transient in a massive evolved star that has an energy range about 10 to the 47 to like low 10 to the 50 ergs. Uh, bottom range set by what it takes to knock off the hydrogen envelope. Top range set by the very lowest energy supernovae we've seen. Okay, so I'm going to gloss over shock breakouts because I'm fairly certain most people here are familiar with them, but really quickly, uh, the shock breakout is a bright flash of light that is emitted when the shock wave reaches the surface of a star. It occurs when the radiation that has been trapped behind the shock through its propagation uh, is now able to stream out in front of that shock. So you get a bright pulse of radiation released on a fairly short time scale. Uh, they tend to be much brighter and spectrally harder than the rest of the light curve. And they also carry some information about the progenitor star itself. The, the properties of the breakout flash are set by the explosion and by the star that it's been moving through. So you can get a lot of information out of the breakout that is otherwise wiped out in the explosion that destroys the star. 
So, like I said, in most cases, it's really hard to recover this information any other way. In the case, in the specific case of very low energy supernovae, you especially want to look for shock breakout because very low energy supernovae, by definition, are very faint and hard to find. Shock breakouts in very low energy supernovae are still dim compared to what we think of as standard shock breakout, but they're definitely brighter than the supernovae themselves. And in fact, as I'm going to touch on, there are some properties that actually make them more attractive to observe than regular shock breakout. Okay, so an aside on the code that was used to do this work, this is the Castro Radiation Hydrodynamic Code. It was developed at Berkeley. It is available, it's free and public. You can find it on GitHub uh, under Boxlib. You can download Castro, you can download Castro Radiation version. Uh, it influenced multi-group flux limited diffusion. I'm not gonna get into the radiation theory, but this is important to this specific case because in order to simulate a shock breakout, you need a code that can, can handle the optically thick to optically thin transition region because, uh, as I mentioned, the shock breakout specifically occurs when you have radiation that was optically thick, that was trapped behind the shock, able to free stream ahead of the shock. So you can't just use a diffusion transport code. You have to use something that can handle that thick to thin transition or you're not going to be able to do shock breakout correctly. Okay, so Castro radiation is fairly new, so we did do a verification validation session. Uh, our test case was supernova 1987A, as it tends to be in supernovae. Uh, in this case, it is actually the best observed in terms of we know what the progenitor looked like, we have uh, some good constraints on what the shock breakout looked like that were gotten very close after the explosion. Uh, it's been modeled by two different groups. It was modeled by Ensman and Burroughs in 1992 and it was modeled by Tolstov in 2012 using two different codes and their results agreed quite well so we can be reasonably confident that if our results agree with theirs then we're doing things correctly in Castro. So here's a quick summary of the results we got for 87A. 87A is not the focus of my talk, so I won't dwell on them, but this is just to let you know that Castro is in fact producing reasonable results. So this is the Ensman and Burroughs light curves. This is for a 2.3 beta explosion. This is for a one beta explosion. And already you can see that the high energy breakout is noticeably brighter and noticeably shorter than the, than the one beta explosion. So this is an indication of how the breakout properties are shaped by the, the explosion itself. Uh, this is our results for the same two models, scaled to essentially be on the same scale as that one. Uh, this is time here, this is luminosity. The absolute value of the time d axis doesn't really matter, it's just counting from the beginning of the simulation. But these, you can see that they have basically the same shape and we're getting uh, similar numbers for the luminosity, the peak luminosity, the peak effective temperature, and the peak color temperature, which is the, the spectral temperature, which I'm going to go into uh, color temperature turns out to be a very interesting and important property, and we'll discuss it more later. But, so this was done using simple electron scattering opacities, which is what was used in the other two simulations, and we get reasonably similar results, and so we can be reasonably confident that Castro is telling us the truth about shock breakout. So this is the progenitor that I spent most of my time modeling. It's a 15 solar mass uh, main, uh, red supergiant. Its final mass was about 13 solar masses. It's about solar metallicity. Uh, this here is the density. This here is the temperature for just the outer region that we really care about. It has a final radius of about six times 10 to the 13 centimeters. We tested quite a range of energies. Uh, the yellow curve here is our highest energy model, which had a final kinetic energy of 1.2 times 10 to the 51. Our very lowest energy model here, the blue curve down there, was all the way down to six times 10 to the, the 46. It's important to note that kinetic energy at breakout is not the same as kinetic energy final. The two quantities are different, and uh, there are some analytic predictions that I'm including that they work, but they only work if you use the final kinetic energy, not the kinetic energy at breakout. The kinetic energy at like the time of explosion, at the time of breakout, and at, at infinity are three different quantities. Uh, 
So here, here are our, our nice little shock waves of various energies. You can see this is the part of the star that hasn't been affected yet. It's the same in all cases because they're all exploding in the same progenitor star. So here are the bolometric light curves. Note that this is on a log time scale in hours. Otherwise, the regular energy breakouts would just be lines right here. They, they pretty much have to be on a log scale for you to just be able to see them. There's, there's quite a diversity in the duration. Uh, so these, the yellow curve and the black curve are our more standard energy supernovae. It's a good check on our breakout simulations. And these curves are your lower energy supernovae. And you can see there's clear trend in peak luminosity and duration. Uh, again, this is on a log scale, so this is actually like 70 hours wide. Uh, so these are the late time light curves. These were calculated using Kepler. This is, uh, again, these are the standard energy ones. These are the later ones. This is also, again, on a log axis with days. So you can see they, they look like regular supernovae. They're just, they're real dim. You're, if you want to catch this, this is really the time when you want to go looking for it. Okay, so some quick comparisons to analytics. Uh, Puro 2013 considered the specific case of breakout in low energy supernovae, gave some formulas to guide observers in luminosity and observed temperature. So we checked them. These, uh, this column is our results. This column is the predictions for luminosity. This column is our results for effective temperature. This is the prediction for effective temperature. And they don't do that badly. The, the analytic predictions are, you know, they're not exactly on the nose, but they're, they're pretty good. But again, you have to use the final kinetic energy in these, these equations if you want to get a reasonable prediction. If you just use the kinetic energy at breakout, they're, they're actually pretty far off. So that's something that kind of needs looking into because how is the breakout supposed to know what the ultimate final kinetic energy of the supernova is? Okay, so let's talk about color temperature. There are two temperatures defined in a shock breakout, the effective temperature and the color temperature. Effective temperature is essentially just from this equation. It's set at the photosphere. It's defined as a function of luminosity. Color temperature is defined by the spectrum. So this is a, a multi-group spectrum of 1987A that we simulated. This peak right here, if you take the frequency at which this peaks, it is not the frequency that you would predict if you just did a black body at the effective temperature. So it has a black body form, but that black body peaks at a different temperature, and we call that the spectral temperature, the color temperature. Uh, so it, it ends up being a dilute black body. So the ratio of color temperature to effective temperature is set by the different depths at the star that the two quantities are set in the, during the radiation's propagation outwards. Uh, there are sev most of the shock breakout simulations that are in the literature that are numeric simulations give a final value for the ratio of the peaks equal to like two to three. That the color temperature is about two to three times higher than the effective temperature. There are some theoretical papers that predict a value more like one to two. The thing is, this is not really set by any fundamental physics. There's no particular law that says color temperature has to be this much of effective temperature. It's set by the temperature and the density profile in the star. And most stars have a reasonably similar profile at the, at the atmosphere, so you're gonna get reasonably similar ratios between the two. But there's no actual reason that it has to be two to three or it has to be one half, et cetera. So we need to consider specifically the case of the color temperature in low energy supernovae. The key is that very low energy supernovae have much lower temperatures behind the shock than a standard energy supernova. And it turns out that makes a big difference in the opacities. Most of the breakout simulations in the literature assume the dominance of electron scattering opacity. That's not necessarily true in the low energy case. This is the kind of temperature range you get for what I'm calling high energy, which you would just call a regular supernova shock breakout. This is the kind of range you get for a very low energy breakout. You know, you're down to like the photoionization limits. Uh, 
The density regimes for all of these are like 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 12. That's what you're looking at in that steep declining atmosphere. Uh, a lot of opacity tables don't really have a lot of data in the very low row, high temperature regime. Uh, when they are populated, they tend to be extrapolations or theoretical predictions. It's actually a little bit tricky to get opacities for this regime because it's just not encountered in most codes. You, you don't really run into this in the middle of a star. So, in theory, this is, I submit to you, that when, if absorptive opacity becomes roughly equal to your scattering opacity, color temperature and effective temperature should converge. They should become equal when those two quantities become equal. Uh, so just to go a little bit more into the specifics of which opacities we use, free-free uh, absorption is, one, is the main component. Uh, Comptonization depends on KT over H nu. So as T drops, again, the T behind the shock is dropping, uh, it becomes less efficient, whereas inverse Bremsstrahlung, which you can see has this nice T to the minus 3.5 dependence, will go up very sharply. A little drop in temperature results in a big increase in inverse Bremsstrahlung absorptive opacity. So it becomes much more significant in your low temperature breakout than it does in your standard energy breakout. Uh, the other one we, the other major one we consider is bound-free absorption. We use a gray Kramer's law opacity form. If you can, if you assume hydrogen and helium are ionized, you can you can make it into a, a gray opacity using metal fraction. And again, it has the same uh, Kramer's law type dependence as inverse Bremsstrahlung. It, it depends on t to the negative 3.5. So a small drop in t gives you a big increase in this opacity. So what you end up with is something like this. This is uh, one of our low energy cases. This is radius. This is specific opacity, centimeters squared per gram. Uh, this is our low energy model, had a final kinetic energy in 48. This is our high energy model of 1.2 beta. The blue solid line is the total opacity, and the green solid line is total absorptive opacity. These dotted lines are the contributions from Compton scattering, Bremsstrahlung, and photoionization, respectively. And you can see that in the low energy case, absorptive opacity is way more significant in relation to the total opacity than it is in this higher energy case. So this is really something that you need to think about. And you need to watch out for tabulated values at, at Ta opacity tables in this regime will sometimes give you negative numbers, which is not as far as I know correct, so watch out for that. Uh, so the bottom line is, if the absorptive opacity is roughly equal to the scattering opacity, we expect the color temperature to become roughly equal to the effective temperature. These are a, a couple of ratios for our models of the maximum uh, absorptive to, um, to total optical depth. In Supernova 1987A, it never really gets above, the absorptive opacity never really goes above 1% of the total opacity. And it, in, the, in our more standard breakout, 4%. But you start dropping in energy and you start getting much bigger fractions, uh, much bigger ratios of absorptive optical depth to total optical depth. So the bottom line from this is that breakouts from very low energy supernovae will be substantially cooler than those from standard energy supernovae. And this will make them even brighter in the optical and the IR. This is, I, I had to keep this in for just the title of the slide at least. Here are some Kepler results compared to some Kepler results. Uh, this, there was recently a report of shock breakout from the Kepler satellite, and we've compared it to some models that were run with the Kepler Stellar Evolution Code, which believe me has caused some confusing emails. Uh, this is, so we're mapping into the Kepler satellite bandpass here. We're not considering filters or anything. We're just saying how much energy is outputted between 0.4 and 0.9 microns. Uh, in this case, this is a higher energy supernova, but the low energy breakout ends up being brighter and longer 
than the standard one because more energy is being emitted in the IR and the very low energy breakouts are substantially longer. Remember I showed you that time plot. As you go down, you're looking at 30 to 70 hours uh, at peak for breakout. So, so this is a, convol a plot of the five earlier, the low en five low energy models again, converted into the Kepler bandpass. So you can see that you, you become much, much closer in peak luminosity because as other breakouts become brighter, uh, they, they also start putting less of their energy into the IR. So you have these two processes working against each other. The brighter the breakout, the harder the spectral temperature, the less energy is actually coming out. So in one particular bandpass, uh, different energies will actually be much closer in peak luminosity. Uh, but the duration, you can see, is still quite different. And again, you're looking at like 30, 30 hour long transients, which are way, way easier to see than, uh, than, than 100 second transients. So if you're going looking for something, uh, these, these are what you want to look for. Okay, so to summarize it for the observers, you're looking for a blue transient. The spectrum, like I've, as I've said, the spectrum is it's redder than a standard energy transient, but you're still looking at a pretty blue event overall. Uh, the, meaning redder than a standard energy breakout means like most of the energy isn't coming out in the X-ray. So this is still something with a spectral temperature that's gonna be about 10 to the four Kelvin or above. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the durations can range from three to 70 hours for our low energy models. Uh, your bolometric luminosity has a pretty big range between about 10 to the 40 to 10 to the 44 at peak. But our IR range, and again, I've just convolved it with the Kepler band pass. If, if you want to know specifically like what's H band versus J band, I, I can tell you, but not now. Um, it, it compresses it much more. You have a much smaller range of luminosities because as your things get brighter, they're also outputting less energy in that band. So how do we look for them? Like I said, the Kepler satellite has already reported a couple of breakouts, which is really cool. Kepler is particularly suited for spotting small luminosity changes in a wide field of view. So at the moment, it's, it's a really good instrument for breakouts specifically. Uh, UV would be great. Like I said, these are red. These are redder, but they're still pretty blue. So the peak is still in the UV. If we had a UV wide field transient observing satellite, that would be great. Please, please build a UV wide field observing transient satellite. Uh, and as I noted, the bolometric lightness, uh, bolometric brightness and duration are inversely correlated. So your brighter events are also gonna be your faster events. So the real challenge here is cadence. You're looking at something longer than a 100 second breakout, but it's still really not that long. You, you need a fairly rapid observing cadence, like once every few hours, uh, maybe once every half an hour or 15 minutes to catch the, the higher energy ones. That's the real challenge in, in seeing breakout. Even these extended ones, cadence is, is really your killer. All right, so let's wrap it up. Uh, very low energy supernovae are interesting and you should go look for them because they will tell us about core collapse failure. Please tell us about core collapse failure. Uh, and the shock breakouts are a much more viable means to observe them than just looking for the supernovae directly. Uh, they behave, these breakouts behave differently than standard energy. You have to take into account the lower temperatures. Uh, they're dimmer, but their lower spectral temperatures mean they actually often end up brighter in the bands that you're observing in. Uh, yeah, they can appear brighter than their standard counterparts, especially in the optical and the IR. All right, question time. How, how will your predictions change uh, if there is a wind? Because that obviously is the case in many of these massive stars. Yeah, winds are the, the big question mark in breakout stuff. If your wind is optically thick for a significant amount of time, uh, you can effectively get breakout at a much bigger radius, which will smear the light out way more. You'll get a much longer duration transient. On the other end, uh, it can absorb a lot of the high frequency light. 
Now, if you're looking in the optical or the IR, you're probably more okay than if you're looking in the UV, but yes, it will definitely affect the breakout stuff. So, I'm going to ask, uh, because of these high entropies in your, your breakouts, do, do, are, are uh, non-LT effects important uh, that you might worry about? And, they, and a related question is, let's say we got a spectrum of one of these. <laughs> uh, what would, would we be able to see of the you know, lines given this cooler temperature that could tell us something about the composition? Yeah. Um, Castro doesn't, is, is an LTE code. It assumes LTE. Uh, I, it's possible to do a simulation after the fact and look at the spectrum and use something like Sedona to do that. We haven't done it yet, so I can't speak to how important it would be. But it would be very interesting to do. Um, you stress that you need a code that can handle uh, optically thin uh, transport, but actually the breakup occurs at an uh, optical depth of C over V, which is roughly 30 or 100 in these dim uh, things. So I'm not sure why you actually need that. And second question, um, do you handle the low frequency tail of the black body emission at the breakout, which I think should be shallower than a real black body? Yeah. Or do you just take a diluted black body? No, um, we do do multi-group simulations, which are capable of having, so uh, most of the bolometric curves are single group, meaning it's assuming that the, the radiation spectrum is a black body at some temperature. But we've also run multi-group simulations, which allow it to have any, any, um, any shape. And you're right, we do see there's a slight shallowing. It's slight, it does depart slightly from a black body. We're calculating the color temperature uh, by looking at which is the peak frequency, but it is slightly different. Yeah. yeah. So the, the <coughs> low energy explosion is, would be important for the origin of the very metal poor stars because lots of fallback we expect. So the, we have modeled the, uh, the Alexei Tolstov and I modeled the low metallicity case for the low energy explosion, which was published just April this year, up to this year. But uh, have you tried those low metallicity cases as well? We haven't tried the low metallicity case here, but yeah, low metallicity has some interesting effects on the spectrum. Uh, in particular, it, it can have some weird effects on the velocity. If you have a really high velocity divergence and a really low metallicity, you can start getting spectral effects that are just due to the velocity at the divergence at the front of the shock. So we haven't done that. Uh, Dan Kaysen and did a paper on, pulsa I want to say, pulsational pair breakout. It might be pair instability breakout uh, that specifically considered the low metallicity case and found slightly different opacities. Elizabeth, this is very interesting work. Um, the question I have for you is a choice of uh, 15 solar masses because um, I thought that uh, papers by Drew Clausen and others show that the failure fraction is much higher, you know, 20, 30 solar mass. And we know 15 solar mass so stars give us type 2p supernovae. Yeah, no, type uh, 15 solar mass stars are definitely explode more often than not. They are a, m a much more common progenitor, so even if there's a very small failure rate at 15, it may be more likely that you're going to see a failed 15, but it really doesn't change that much with mass. Uh, like I said, uh, I mentioned on a couple of slides, I didn't really talk about it. We did also test a 25, uh, and the, between the 25 and the 15 is like, it's, it's maybe a factor of two in radius, if you're assuming about the same shock energy, you actually end up with roughly the same type of breakout. As long as, like, as, long as the radius doesn't change a huge amount, you don't end up with a, a very different duration. So these results are applicable to most things in that failure range. You mentioned Kepler, but you didn't mention Tessadol, which is going yes. to have you know, 2,400 square degree field of view, and all that field of view is sent down with a cadence of like 30 minutes. Have you yes. looked at rates at all for these kind of events? I haven't looked tests? at rates. I actually worked on tests as an undergrad, so I, I, do, I did know about it, and I'm really excited to see it fly, finally. Um, you're right, tests would also have uh, a similar similar prospects for observing. I didn't mention it because it's, it's not up yet and Kepler has already reported data. But yeah, TESS has similar capabilities and they would be similarly useful. Uh, in your very first slide, you, you didn't say, but you showed that there's a, there's a problem in the, in, the, in the missing core collapse supernovae. There's 
when you compare the expectations from the star formation history, but that's not necessarily true anymore. Yeah, uh, I, I know that uh, the, the rates have been updated a bit. Right, uh, they've gone down by about a factor of two, and yeah. in, the, in the annual reviews on the star formation history by Medow and Dickinson, they actually show that with their new star formation history, it actually matches perfectly. The They've actually got it. So last I checked, with, there with was no, like no a failures. 20 or 30% gap. So I'll have okay. to look up that paper, yeah. 